say at least 60% of you, if not more, have used SQL or know how to write SQL. Uh, it's, it's a popular language. It is the language of data. Uh, it, it's, here's a Stack Overflow survey from this year, 2019, that shows SQL is 56% uh, 50, uh, or more developers know how to use it. And you can see the category that it's in. We've heard a lot of JavaScript uh, here today already. Obviously, that's the top language, but HTML and SQL, those three languages are kind of the lingua franca of development. Uh, the next one down is still very popular, but not really in the same category. So SQL is the language that rules data. I want to talk about today is a little bit of the history of SQL and relational. Hopefully, many of you know this, but some of you may not. So it's a good review and it should be fun. We're going to talk about NoSQL today. I work for Couchbase, so my life is NoSQL. Uh, and you may be wondering why we're we talking about SQL if we're also talking about NoSQL. Well, you're going to see. And then what I want to focus on today about NoSQL is analytics and reporting part of it. And I'll sum up and give you some resources to go and learn some more. Um, I'll try to answer questions if I have short answers for them during the session. If not, please come and talk to me afterwards out there next to the cookies is where I will be. So SQL and relational. SQL and relational. Relational and SQL. So EF Codd, this guy on the left here, is the man who wrote the original uh, paper on relational databases. He invented the relational model. He also created a language. He designed a language for interacting with relational data called Alpha. And Alpha was never implemented, but it was influential on languages that came after that. So EF Codd is the one who's kind of responsible for coming up with the idea of tables and relations and so on. SQL was then created later on by uh, this guy on the right, uh, Don Chamberlain, who we're going to see more from later, and Raymond Boyce, who's no longer with us, so I couldn't find a picture of him. But it was a language that looked at relational databases and said, hey, we want to create a language that's more English friendly. Much like in the early days of compilers, we created languages that were compiled down to machine language. So we wouldn't have to write machine language. We could just write something more English friendly. These days, of course, SQL and relational are kind of used interchangeably. So I say, oh, I work with SQL databases. Well, do you really work with SQL or do you work with relational databases and you write SQL queries to deal with them? It's, I'm kind of splitting hairs, I guess, but it's an important distinction to point out that they are not invented at the same time, invented by different people, and, uh, they're, but they're kind of synonymous these days. All right? There have been criticisms of SQL over the years. As I said, SQL rules data, no question. But there are some criticisms. There's always trade-offs. There's some things that are not perfect about it. I know that's shocking to find. But uh, some, of the, some of the main criticisms are up there. In Peen's mismatch, a lot of ink's been spilled over that. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, scaling relational databases traditionally has been challenging. And inflexibility, kind of by design. Relational databases have a sort of a big design up front approach, and that makes them less flexible than other approaches to data. So impedance mismatch, just to review. Everyone familiar with this term? Is this something new to anybody? OK. So the idea here is I'm storing my data in a relational database. I'm storing it flat, in pieces, in tables. So I have over there a shopping cart. Each shopping cart has items in it. And then uh, to get a shopping cart, I'd have to join uh, the first row there in the first table with the two rows there in the bottom table to get a complete shopping cart. But in my application, I would typically have a class that would store that shopping cart information all together in one place. So we've got this mismatch of how the data is being accessed, used, and stored. That's called an impedance mismatch. And the way we've tr traditionally dealt with this is a tool like an ORM, uh, Object Relational Mapper, which will attempt to uh, translate between these two different formats to uh, deal with that impedance mismatch. And those tools, if you've used them before, if you're new to ORMs, you're thinking, oh, this is great. It really saves me a lot of time. It does a lot of the work for me. If you've used ORMs like myself for 10 years, you're like, yeah, they're pretty good for 80% of the time. And that last 20% can be a real pain in the neck. So ORMs uh, are attempting to deal with that problem there of impedance mismatch. Scaling is another issue. When I talk about scaling, I mean having your database uh, be able to handle more traffic, more load, more processing. And so there's two different approaches to scaling. These are not mutually exclusive. You can use them together with each other. But vertical scaling is, OK, we have a database. It's running on this machine over there on the left. 
we are experiencing problems with it. It's not processing enough, it's not big enough, it's not fast enough. So what should we do? Buy a bigger server. More processors, more RAM, more disks, faster uh, disks, all that sort of stuff. And we can keep doing that and go bigger and bigger and bigger until one of two things happen. One, it gets prohibitively expensive to do that. Oracle will gladly take your money for each of those cores that you upgrade to. Uh, or you reach a ceiling at a certain point where uh, we can't really get much more performance out of a single machine. And this is based on an article you may have heard of before called this No More Free Lunch or uh, The Death of the Free Lunch. That's a, a very famous article. I'll give you a link to that one later on. So another approach to scaling is instead of making our single machine bigger and bigger and bigger, why don't we scale horizontally and distribute the data amongst multiple machines? So we add nodes, this is called clustering. We add nodes to a cluster and we scale out horizontally to add more capacity. We, don't have, we can use more commodity, inexpensive machines to do that scaling and it's more flexible. We don't have to take down our database to do an upgrade uh, and so on. It can be cheaper, it can scale bigger, but horizontal scaling is difficult to do with relational databases traditionally because of the way they're designed. They're related to each other, they're constrained to a table, they uh, have a relationship. Uh, each piece of data is not isolated. The other one is inflexibility. Uh, relational model was created before the Agile Manifesto uh, was uh, popularized and created. The Agile Manifesto, uh, everyone here, anyone here claim to be Agile or using Agile or want to use Agile? Yes, okay. So the Agile Manifesto says we value responding to change over following a plan. This by, right here is definition of following a plan, which isn't to say there's no value in it, just that it's more difficult to respond to change when we have to follow a very strict plan like this. So schema changes become a problem. We have to go from this schema here where I have a customer table, maybe there's billing information in that customer table, and the business requirement comes down that says, okay, we want to allow multiple payment options. To deal with that, I have to create a new table, migrate data from customer over to billing, remove those fields from customer, create foreign key constraints for a really simple schema change. With 100,000 records, a million records, or more, this becomes very difficult, very slow, and could very, be very disruptive to your development process. And that's a simple change. Anyone using a schema this simple? It's gonna be very, very complicated to do, and I'm, I'm sure you, you know this already, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but that, that means the more expensive and risky the change is going to be. So before I keep going and keep bashing uh, uh, relational databases some more, I want to give you a disclaimer that your relational database is probably fine. If you're not experiencing these problems yet, fine. Keep going, doing what you're doing, that's totally fine. I'm not here to convince you to completely ditch relational and switch to non-relational. That would be silly. So if you're not experiencing those problems, great. But don't turn off your brain just yet because you may experience them some way down the road in the future for a different project. So just keep this stuff in mind. When you're, you're not feeling that pain yet, but you may feel that somewhere in the future. All right, so let's talk about NoSQL a little bit and how it attempts to address some of those criticisms of relational world and some of the trade-offs inherent with it because, spoiler alert, it's not perfect either. It's a different approach, a different set of trade-offs. With a NoSQL database, typically you're gonna store JSON data. So JSON data, is more isolated. It's pieces of data that can live on their own. Uh, typically these are referred to as documents. And they can be therefore sharded and split amongst all the nodes in that cluster very easily because they live on their own. They're islands of data. They don't, they're not relational. They don't follow a schema. They live anywhere you want on the cluster. And for some reason when I think of sharding, which is the tool you use, the term you use for that. I think of this scene from Superman. I don't know why. He's got these crystal shards and it just, it's in my brain. It's some sort of weird synesthesia thing. So an example here of a, of a document. This is a piece of data in a NoSQL database. This is a document, very simple document, represents an airline. So the data is stored as JSON format there. It has a key. Uh, so that's, that's a very important thing to point out here is the document key. So in relational databases you have keys, primary keys and, and so on, but this is basically 
a little different. This is basically like a key value store. So I can look up documents by the key. I can make changes to a document if I know that key in advance. Um, so the way I've designed that, I've put this on the slide here, it's basically a, from Couchbase. Other databases have a similar approach. They, they'll put the document key inside the JSON or some other sort of approach, but they're all basically the same. It's a JSON piece of data with a key, an ID, some sort of identifier for that data. So this JSON data right here is not that impressive. This is, could easily translate this into, into a table with four columns, right? So that's not terribly impressive. But with JSON, of course, we can do a lot more complex shapes of data. So here's an example here of an airline route. And a route is just uh, a, a, a route on an airline between a source, a, a, a source airport and a destination airport. So this one is uh, Columbus to Chicago, which I fly very often. Uh, but uh, so this route, I want to point two things out from this document. One is the schedule field. In a relational database, that would be at least one separate table with a bunch of rows in it and foreign keys, at least, right? In a JSON document, it is all part of that same route document. It's all in one place. So we've done some denormalization up to what's usually referred to as an aggregate route, for those of you familiar with, with uh, domain-driven design, because we don't need to split that data out. That schedule belongs to the route. It, is, it doesn't really mean anything away from the route, so we can keep it together in one piece. And so we don't have the impedance mismatch. We can take this JSON and translate it directly to a C-sharp, Java, et cetera, object without any sort of object relational mapper. Okay? Um, and there's also no schema to follow here. So if I wanted to add fields to just this one document, I could do that without affecting any other documents, any other route documents or anything else. Now, it doesn't mean you should go hog wild and just add whatever you want to a document. You should have some discipline of data. But you have the flexibility. You don't have to wait for your schema to change and have any downtime or affect your customers in production to make that the change to your data. I also want to point out that because you can normalize data like I did with schedule, doesn't mean you should always normalize. If you look at the airline ID field up there, I chose not to denormalize that airline data. I'm just saying, if you want the information for this airline, go f look up this document, airline 5209. That will tell you which airline that this route belongs to, which I think is actually United Airlines. So there is still a relationship between pieces of data. There's less of them, though. There's fewer of those splits of data everywhere. So we're going up to the aggregate level. With NoSQL, for those who aren't familiar, these are some of the basic operations of NoSQL. And it's called that because you don't write SQL to do them. If you, if you know the key of a document, you can get it by the key. You can update it by the key and delete by the key. And those are your basic key-based operations. And typically, a NoSQL database will then have another way to do operational. I'm going to put operational in quotes for now. I'll explain that a little bit later. Uh, to get data when you don't know the key. So I want, to look up, uh, I want to look up all the flights leaving from Chicago. I don't necessarily know every key for them. So some approaches are a MapReduce type of approach where you write some a function that runs in parallel and com computes that ahead of time. Uh, Mongo has their own sort of proprietary like JavaScript query language you can use. And SQL++ is another language you can use for operational queries. Yes, you can use SQL to query NoSQL data. Um, I'm not going to talk about that operationally today, but I wanted to point out there's lots of options for your operational queries. So one of the criticisms of NoSQL, and there are many, but the one I want to talk about mainly today is what about reporting and analytics? How do I do this with NoSQL data? You know, I, you know, I, I understand the benefits of the scaling and the flexibility, but what do, these are the problems I have to solve now, is that I have large amounts of data spread out across a cluster or multiple clusters, and uh, if I want to run queries against them, I could have an impact on operations. So my customers are interacting with my website. They're hitting the database with their queries. Now I come along, and I have a complicated analytical query to run against that data. I don't do proper indexing. I run that query, and it's, uh, people start timing out when they're trying to make their purchases or trying to browse my catalog. And so I'm really impacting that, uh, those operations. I don't want to do that. So that's what I want to talk about mainly today is 
the analytics and reporting part of dealing with large amounts of JSON data. And I want to define some terms here first. So when I say operational, these are the moment-to-moment -moment operations that, uh, and queries that your website or your application need to function to serve customers. So your customers come to your website, there's hundreds of them, there's thousands of them, they're hitting your website, doing all kinds of, of things, and those queries are running a lot. There are, a lot of those queries are running over and over again. Um, those queries are going to be relatively simple, well-defined, well-understood, and well-indexed. They're not going to be, they're not going to change very often. The second one I want to define is analytics, and I'm going to use the term analytics in the sense of operations and queries you need to perform data science, reporting, analysis tasks on huge swaths of data. For instance, back to the beginning of your company when it started. You want to analyze every newspaper article from the time since 1890 or whatever, whenever it started. You want to do really massive analytics, complicated, tons and tons of data, and you, you, know, you have specialized roles for doing this kind of analytics. And the third one I want to talk about, which you may not have heard this term before, is operational analytics. And this sits between them. It's closer to the real time uh, uh, of the spectrum, though. Uh, and this is maybe you're going to analyze only the last six months of data, or the last uh, six days, or the last six hours, or the last six minutes. You want something that's closer to real time of your data. So dashboards, and reporting, and trend analysis, um, that's what operational analytics is going to sit in. So based on those terms, I think, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm guessing that many of you are more in the operational analytics part of the spectrum than analytics. Would you, is that a fair assumption? Is, or is anyone really analyzing massive amounts of data? Because I'm going, I'm going to probably using the term analytics and operational analytics interchangeably the rest of the session, just not on purpose, just because uh, that's just, uh, you know, my, my kind of shorthand. Uh, so if that's okay, as proceeding four, I'm going to try to try to use operational analytics. But I, I, if I say analytics, I probably mean operational analytics. So I want to give you some more details about operational analytics. What does what does a workload look like for operational analytics? So we have fewer queries, uh, not necessarily uh, fewer different types of queries, but they're not being run by the hundreds and thousands by your customers against an active website. They're being run by internal facing apps or uh, nightly jobs or maybe even uh, business analysts running ad hoc queries. They're not the same volume of queries that are running against your operational data. They are a lot more ad hoc. So you're answering questions as they come in from the business, as they come in from the product managers and the product owners. They have questions, they want to get answers, and maybe they this query has never been written before. So they could be very complex. You know, a, a simple operational query might be, okay, show me uh, all the sneakers you have for sale on your website. That's a relatively simple query. A more complex query would be, I wanna see a list of all the customers who purchase sneakers at our Oklahoma store between uh, this week and the end of this week, and the value of the transaction was between 50 and $100. Uh, something com complex like that would be more interesting uh, would be more like an operational analytics query. Performance is always nice to have, right? But in this area of operational analytics, it is not the primary concern. Uh, because we're not serving a customer, earlier we, we saw some stats about uh, the time to, um, ba the bounce rate, and how a uh, number of milliseconds until the bounce rate. We're not in an area where we're going to affect the bounce rate here because these are queries that are not being directly executed or being caused executed by our customers. So we still want them to be as fast as possible, but it's not the most important thing. So in my experience, there are four, there are four methods that enterprises work with that do operational analytics. And I don't have experience with all of these, uh, most of them, uh, but not all of them. So the first one, this was my very first job out of college as a software developer. Our method of doing operational analytics was, I don't know, we don't really have a plan. We don't think about it. We just kind of have a bunch of access databases spread out across our enterprise. 
Uh, we, we copy snapshots of operational data when we feel like it or when we can. Uh, or maybe we just link to it directly and hope that no one screws it up. Does that sound familiar to anyone? You don't have to raise your hands. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so that's, that's the first one I see a lot, uh, unfortunately, still even today. Um, so yeah, all right. The second one I see a lot as well, and this is also something I've seen in the past, is like a data warehouse approach, or sometimes they use other names for it, but it's basically, we have some operational data on the left, we don't want to run queries directly against it, so we'll copy it to some other database, like a SQL database, for instance, so we can run SQL queries on it, because we know how to write SQL. 60% or more of our enterprise knows how to write SQL. Uh, so we create an ETL job there. So this is pretty good. This is a better approach than the first one. But the main thing I want to point out here, and this is from experience, is that little arrow in the middle is deceptively simple looking. Creating an ETL, maintaining an ETL, or paying someone to build an ETL is a difficult thing. Uh, you still have the impedance mismatch problem, so you still have to think about schema. You can't just throw whatever's on the left into the right here. You've got, it's got to match up the schema. Uh, if it's complex JSON data like NoSQL databases are using, that's even more difficult to throw into here. Um, not to mention uh, the size and performance of SQL is still an issue. So if we're throwing multiple data sources into here, this could really balloon up and get big. And, and again, I just want to stress, if you've done ETLs before, if you've written them, that is not an easy task. That is not just writing an arrow. Uh, it is, uh, that could be a full-time job right there, depending on your organization. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the second answer. Better than the first, but still has some problems. The thing I like about this is we know how to write SQL. So once it's in there, we can write SQL. We can get our answers. The third answer I've seen, I don't have uh, personal experience with this, so I had to look up this really nice uh, blog post here. I'll, I'll share these, I'll share a link to the slides at the end of the session so you can get this link out here. It is Hadoop. So oftentimes people think analytics, they think big data, they think Hadoop. That's fine. Hadoop is designed for that. It's designed for massive, massive scale. It originally came out of Google trying to basically store the internet to, to search it. Um, but uh, using Hadoop and using the Hadoop ecosystem, that's, that's like a whole other topic. That's, this is like another several full-time jobs in one picture here. Uh, so this may be too big of a hammer for the operational analytics. For the analytics analytics, this may be the right tool because HDFS can store all your newspaper articles back from the 1800s. It can store the entire internet and do it relatively cheaply but it's not terribly fast. And that's what all this stuff on top of it tries to help address. So a lot of times, people don't just use Hadoop. They'll use Hadoop with uh, Spark on top to try to use more memory. So now they gotta, they gotta uh, hook up Spark to Hadoop, and then you can use Spark SQL on top of that to start writing some SQL. Or you go the Hive route. I think Hive also makes the SQL API available. So this may be overkill for operational analytics. And it certainly still has the ETL problem down here. It's a little easier, because we can, we can dump a lot more stuff into Hadoop um, than we can in a relational database, but you still have to figure out, you know, do I use Kafka, Scoop, Flume, some other method to get data into Hadoop, and then how do I query it, how do I maintain this, uh, or again, how much do I have to pay to get a consultant in to figure this stuff out for me. So this is really kind of designed for the petabytes, and if you don't have petabyte size operational analytics questions, then this may be overkill. But again, we're getting, we're getting better. So uh, as you might have guessed, the fourth one is what I want to talk about mainly today is SQL++. And I told you I'd come back to this guy down here, Don Chamberlain, the inventor of SQL. He's written a book called SQL++ for SQL users. And I also mentioned Couchbase. He's actually a, a consultant, a, a tech, uh, he's on the board of technical consultants for Couchbase. So Couchbase is a NoSQL database, but we are definitely all in committed to SQL as a language. This book, I'll give you a link to it later. It's on Amazon. It's also, Couchbase has made a free PDF for you if you want to check out the book. Um, just want to check how we're doing on time. Seems to be okay. So just a quick SQL review, and hopefully this isn't going to break anyone's brain. I know it's been a long day so far, but I have a table on the left and a query on the right, and this query will get, hopefully, I didn't actually test this. I just, this is all PowerPoint development right here, so 
if I, if I, if there's a syntax error, I'm sorry. But the idea here is I'm getting the first row of the my, of the my table over there with this query. All right. So that's relational of a table and SQL. So how would SQL against non-relational, against JSON data look? So I'll give you a link to this as well, but there's a, a video with Don Chamberlain. And he, at first, was kind of resistant to the idea. He says, well, SQL doesn't make sense because you're not using tables. But then he, he thought about it some more, and he says, well, if you look at JSON data like that, and you squint kind of hard, it looks like a table. So we can do a similar thing here. We've got three documents in, uh, it's not a table anymore, it's a collection. Sometimes it's called a collection, sometimes it's called a bucket or a, a key space or whatever, but it's a collection of JSON documents. And we'll write a query against that bucket here, the same sort of thing. So I'm gonna select the first record there. Uh, I'm just selecting Matt and Groves. Okay. So obviously both can get more complicated. These are very simple examples, but that's, that's the idea. This, is, uh, this all came out of a research paper from UCSD uh, called SQL++ Querying Language, and I will give you a link to this as well. This is a free white paper you can check out. Uh, but there's some students that put this together in 2015. And uh, then, so Couchbase got a hold of it, my company, before I joined with them, in fact, and said, we'd like to actually implement this. So much like uh, in the early days, EFCOD had the alpha language and the relational paper. Uh, and then later, Don Chamberlain said, we're going to actually implement something like this. So Couchbase said, we're going to implement this language in our database. And so Couchbase created Nickel, which is an operational query. Uh, this is the first implementation of this research paper. Uh, in a production app. And then they went on to use it later for analytics, which I'm going to talk about today. SQL++ is backwards compatible. So you can kind of think of it like the C and C++ relationship, SQL and SQL++ relationship. All the stuff you'd expect from SQL is there in SQL++. Yes joins, uh, group by, order by, limit, let, and so on. They're all there in the language. It's the, the language itself is, is the same, but the underlying data is different. It's JSON data instead of tables and rows. But SQL++ has superpowers. That's the plus plus part. Uh, SQL is made for flat relational data, so if we want to query the more uh, rich JSON data, we have to give it some more superpowers. So I'm going to go through four of them. I think I have time for that. There's a lot more than I'm covering, but I'm going to cover four interesting ones. So suppose we have data like this now. We have two JSON documents, and those documents themselves have sub-documents, or nested objects. So I have name and address. Address itself is a JSON object. Well, how would I go about querying like the city or the state in, in SQL? Based on your SQL knowledge, there's not really a way to do that, because there's, no, there's not really such a thing as a nested object in SQL like that. Well, the answer is we add a dot. Select address.city just like you'd expect in JavaScript or C or Java. Just use dotted notation to navigate that object. Or project it or select you know, a conditional on it, et cetera. So dotted syntax. First superpower is just a period. That's great. Uh, what about arrays? So over here we've got Matt and his favorite foods and Emma and her favorite foods. And it's just a list of strings. It could be a list of objects. It could be a list of objects that have arrays, that have objects, that have arrays, et cetera. But we're gonna keep it simple for one slide here. And I wanna find out, give me all the people who have, uh, or no, no, we're not there yet. So I wanna find out uh, what is the second favorite food of everybody in my database, so Matt and Emma. So how would we go and address the, in the uh, second item in that array? Any guesses? If you, if you guessed uh, braces, you were right. So select favorite foods and one, give me cheesecake and give me lucky charms. Easy as that. So this is, again, you're probably familiar with JavaScript or, I mean, this is common indexing syntax in many languages and SQL. So there we go. Easy as that. Superpower two. Uh, I want to go to unnest. This is a little more complicated. And uh, it's kind of hard to demonstrate in one slide, but uh, suppose we had this JSON data over here on the left. We have Matt, again, and, and favorite foods. And those are my real favorite foods, by the way, just for future reference. Um, but in a relational database, favorite foods would be a separate table with a foreign key, right? So I might do some sort of join between them to get pizza Matt, cheesecake Matt, donuts Matt as my end result, as my result set, joining them together. With the JSON data, the way it is like this, already nested in the data, I can't really 
do that uh, with just plain syntax. I could get the favorite foods array by accessing it by the key, but suppose I want to flatten this data up. I want to unnest that array and combine it with the, the root data. This is, a, uh, this is what the unnest keyword does. So I'm going to take favorite foods, I'm going to unnest it into this alias called food. And so it's going to flatten that data up. And I call this an intra document join because, uh, well, that's what it is, basically. You're joining a array that's inside the document with, with the rest of the document. So the result of this would be pizza mat, cheesecake mat, donuts mat. So I start with one JSON object, and I return three. Okay. I know that, that's probably a lot to take in. That's totally fine. This was, it took me a while to understand this concept, too, when I first looked at it. Let's do one more. So quantification. So earlier on, I had that array query where I just said, yeah, go ahead. I could say unnest you dot favorite foods. Could I get rid of this alias? Mm -hmm. um, no. no, no. So I'm actually doing a, a join here. So I need to call this something. I can't just go up there and say select you dot favorite foods. Uh, I, I don't think that would work. Because I, I have to have the unnest in there, and I have to specify what to unnest, and then where am I going to unnest it to? I think. We could, we could try it. Maybe afterwards, we'll, we'll, I got it running on my laptop. We can try it out there, see if it works. I don't claim to be an expert in all uh, SQL. I'm no, no Don Chamberlain, let me tell you. Um, OK, so quantification. So earlier on, I showed you how to access an object by an array index, right? That's kind of neat, but I probably want to do something more complex on an array, right? I want to find out. Tell me all the people who's, who have pizza as a favorite food. OK? So I want to probably do some sort of looping through that favorite foods array, if I'd think about it like that, or, or examine all the items in that array. So what we can do here is we can do this syntax here, these last four lines. And this is kind of like a, uh, a lambda, or that's how I think of it anyway, a lambda or anonymous method, where I say, for anything, any variable f, and we're going to define f as all the items in favorite foods. Do any of them satisfy this, f equals pizza, and then end. So it's return every record that satisfies this sort of lambda right here on that array. So that's going to return what? What would you say it's going to return? Matt. Matt, because Emma doesn't like pizza, but Matt does. That's my daughter's actual favorite foods, too, by the way. Sorry? What is the EFT case? From EFT case? Oh, that's a, a mistake on my part. It should say my users. <laughs> Thank you. EFT, EFTest was an actual bucket I was actually writing queries against and testing this out. So, yeah, you caught me. You got me a syntax there. Okay, so SQL. This is all cool. It's a research project, and, and Couchbase is doing it. Yes, what other implementations are out there? Is this an industry standard yet? I think yes, it should be. I think yes, it will be. Right now, uh, we're kinda, it's kind of squishy, right? So we, there's a couple other products, uh, not products, but projects that are using SQL++. I'll go over them briefly. So Couchbase, of course, Asterisk DB, Apache Drill, and I think there are some others coming soon. I have some information that I probably can't share, um, but, and, and some of it's speculation, so I'm not going to share that. But the, this is something you're going to see more of. It may be called something else besides SQL++, but it, it, it will be coming. So Couchbase's implementation uh, addresses some of the issues, some of the criticisms I had of those, those four answers early on. So over there in Couchbase, you have your data service. And this is where all your operational queries, all your customers are hitting that data in order to work with your website. So what Couchbase is, has a built-in service that will, that little arrow there, that, that little uh, tiny arrow going from one to the other, that's the analytics service. It's a shadow copy of the data on the left. So that data is a real-time shadow copy, read-only, that I can run these SQL++ queries against to do my analytics, my complicated analytics, ad hoc queries, and get results. Now, that arrow in the middle, I mentioned that earlier, that being uh, deceptively small. In this case, in Couchbase's case, 
we're talking two lines of code to get that uh, running. Two lines of code you have to execute one time to get that, um, get that, that flow of information going. So it's not a detail you have to build or manage or worry about changing schema. It's just going to be a real-time copy of that data to another node in the cluster. So it technically is an ETL, but it is real-time, created with two simple commands, and it's completely automated otherwise. Uh, I'd show you a demo if we had more time with this. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. And we also get workload isolation. So if I put in here some garbage SQL query that's going to bring down my whole node somehow, it only brings down this shadow data set. It does not affect my customer's operational data at all. But I would challenge you to write a garbage query for this because it's actually pretty good at, uh, at parsing those. The other one is Asterix DB. This is, uh, if you go to their website, this is known as a big data management system. Yeah, go ahead. In regular SQL databases, yes. when we issue queries, we, especially if it's large, we utilize indices. Yes. Yes. How is this happening? Okay, so the question was, we use indexes on SQL, otherwise the query could be very slow. So in this case, and this is actually the point of asterisk DB, I'll show you in the next slide. The, the copy, the shadow data set copy there is, uh, it's already sort of pre-indexed, if you will. So it's, it's designed to handle ad hoc queries as they come in. Okay, so it, it's not going to be as fast as the well-understood, well-indexed queries on the data service, but it's going to be fast enough where you don't have to worry about writing indexes yourself. You can write indexes yourself. In some specialized situations, you may need to write indexes. But to start with, and this will be great if I show you the demo, um, maybe I will actually if I have enough time, uh, you don't have to worry about writing indexes here. The sweet spot of the maximum size. So uh, I would say in, in, in case of Couchbase, in this case, uh, Couchbase is usually kind of tops out on the terabytes right now. Uh, future versions are working on getting that ceiling higher, but we're looking at, we're looking at terabytes of data, right? So smaller than your Hadoop petabytes, but still bigger than your one node SQL databases. Okay. Asterix DB is actually an open source project that's also related to UCSD. And this is actually what Couchbase has uh, forked and put into Couchbase Server. Well, I don't know if forked is the right word, but um, they've used Asterix DB in Couchbase Server. Um, however, for Asterix DB, you do need an ETL. You need your own ETL to put data into there. It comes with some adapters that are built already, like RSS and Twitter and things like that. But Asterix is essentially what's been taken and put into Couchbase, and we've written our ETL to make that seamless already inside the product. If you're not using Couchbase, you might want to look into Asterix DB and, and pushing the data into there. The other one is Apache Drill, which I don't have much experience with. Anyone used Apache Drill or heard of it before? Just a kind of a straw poll, no? Okay. So this is a strictly no ETL SQL++ implementation. Uh, and uh, I fired it up in Docker to try it out and it had this funny quote on there, this isn't your grandfather's SQL. But what this, how this seems to work is that it seems to directly access the databases you want to query. And this is via ODBC uh, and, and things like that. And so you can write SQL++, it will go out to all your databases, query them, and then come back with results. I'm concerned about operational impact of this because it's going to actually hit your real production databases. And I'm just concerned about the, uh, the impact of that. But it's, it's pretty interesting the way it works, so definitely worth checking out. Okay, we're running short on time here. I won't get to that demo. If you want to see it, I'll be out there by the cookies. They say you only remember three things from any given presentation, so here they are. One, stop saying no SQL. It doesn't mean no SQL anymore. We're querying JSON data with SQL. It's more accurate, I think, to say SQL++. Plus, I just don't like the term no SQL in general. SQL++ is just SQL that most of you already know with a few superpowers to deal with JSON. And I want you to look into SQL++ as a way to minimize your ETL efforts and maximize your SQL skills to do operational analytics. I'm going to share these slides with you. I'll have the link at the end. But uh, here's some resources on uh, EFCOD and the free lunch and the SQL paper some sort of good history there, if nothing else, check it out. The EFCOD paper, 
Reading over that, it's a paper from 1970, reading over that with modern NoSQL databases in mind, it's actually amazing how prescient he was sort of predicting those. It's very, very cool. Um, UCSD Research, they have a forward project which SQL++ is a part of, and the white paper there, I think Cornell publishes that, it's totally free, you can view that white paper out there. Don Chamberlain, he has a book I mentioned, and if you want to get a free copy of the book, it's a pretty easy read, but right there on couchbase.com. Some great videos, the, the squint hard I think is in one of those videos, and then he was on a, a larger tech panel about query language evolution overall, definitely check those out. And um, I'm also a resource for you. Um, you can find me on Twitter. I'm actually doing some live coding on Twitch. If any of you are interested in, in hanging out and asking questions live on Twitch, go to the Couchbase forums if you have technical questions about anything Couchbase or, or analytics specifically. Find me after the session, again, cookies. And the slides, I just posted these to SlideShare, bit.ly slash techwatchmat. You can go get those slides with all those links there. This is my gorgeous family. We just got back from an Alaskan cruise. It was amazing. You should all go. Um, I've got two minutes left, so maybe one question, but before I take that question, I want to say uh, you guys are all amazing being here on a Saturday to come and learn some cool stuff, so I just really appreciate you spending time with me. Thank you for hanging out in this room. Thank you for coming to Detroit Tech Watch. Yes? So all the data you said was going to be like based on files, um, uh, but how about like real data, like videos and all the big data on the files? Like, the so, so, so the question was, all, everything I've been querying is JSON files. That's not strictly true. It's not necessarily files. Uh, the way it's stored can vary between databases. But then the question was, what about like big binary data and things like that? Yeah, this is, SQL++ is not the tool to analyze binary data. It would be um, if you were extracting metadata from those, you would store that. And we actually, Couchbase has a customer that does this. You extract metadata from videos, images, and audio, store that in a JSON database, and that's what you would be querying. You would use other tools for querying the really big binary video, audio, that kind of stuff. 